Good evening. My name is Deanna Kane, and I am a manager of an alumni engagement for Alumni UBC. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion, Beyond Me Too and I Will, Changing Workplace Culture. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are pleased to partner in support of UBC's Equity and Inclusion Office and tonight's conversation. Over the last 18 months, we have partnered to host events on current and topical subjects. Thank you for carving out the time to participate in tonight's discussion. This evening's event is in response to the recent flow of vacu- I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's not in the script, but <laughs> obviously an important discussion that we're part of tonight. The recent flow of accusations of harassment in the media and the social media campaigns that have established greater awareness of and supportive community for victims of harassment. We are thrilled to welcome you all to the Robert H. Lee Alumni Center, a home for alumni for life. Our alumni community is now 325,000 strong, living in more than 140 countries. In the spring, we began celebrating a significant milestone. The Alumni UBC 100, the 100th birthday of Alumni UBC your Alumni Association. We hope you'll enjoy this commemorative video we put together. For the last century, from each of the places we called home, our paths converged at UBC. We worked hard, supported each other, and graduated with a sense of accomplishment. We were shaped by the knowledge and experiences we gained and know they contributed to who we've become. As individuals, we are talented and unique, and as one, we're a powerful movement of difference makers. Knowing that we're stronger together, Alumni UBC was formed by UBC's first graduates on May 4, 1917. Now, 100 years on, we're more than 325,000 strong, spanning over 140 countries. And when we bring our ideas, interests, and energy together, it's a beautiful thing. To mark our 100th year, we're building our community around the globe with an ambitious goal, making 100,000 connections. And there are many ways to take part. There's everything from joining one of our social media communities to attending or hosting one of 100 dinners in whatever part of the globe you live. You can also participate in an official Alumni UBC event, either in person or online, and visit the Robert H. Lee Alumni Center on our Vancouver campus the home of UBC Alumni for Life. The first and easiest way for you to connect is to add yourself to our global alumni map at alumni.ubc.ca. It's quick and simple. So join us in celebrating this remarkable moment in our history by connecting with each other and UBC. And stay tuned for more to come. Happy 100th birthday, Alumni UBC. So, as you just saw in our video, May 4th, um, 2017 marked the 100th birthday and is a tremendous milestone for, um, sorry, so we're celebrating the power of our global community with an ambitious goal making 100,000 alumni connections during our centennial year. You can find out more about all the ways to take part at alumni.ubc.ca. Tonight's conversation is currently being live streamed. I'm glad that everybody could witness my emotional moment. <laughs> wherever you are. Um, and a recording of this evening's program <laughs> will be historically <laughs> documented <laughs> and made available on the Alumni UBC digital library, as well as the Equity Inclusion Office's event page. Please keep it up for a long time. <laughs> a special thanks to our webcast partner, the Irving K. Barber Learning Center, who's providing this live stream um, of our event. 
Usually we'd encourage you to turn off your cell phones, but don't do that. We would love you to tweet about the event um, using at alumniubc and at equityubcv. And the hashtag for tonight's event is Beyond Me Too. Tonight we'll be using an audience engagement platform to include everyone in the conversation. Any mobile device will work with this web-based platform. I will walk you through how to use it. So pull out your device, whatever it may be, and follow along. Uh, first go to slido.com. The URL and tonight's hashtag are being projected on the screen. And use our hashtag BeyondMeToo to sign in. So this platform will allow you to ask questions and comment in real time throughout tonight's program. You can input questions by clicking the ask button. Other attendees can like your questions by giving it a thumbs up um, to the right. And when we get to the question and answer portion of the evening, our moderator will address the top, the top questions from the audience to the panel. If you wish to direct your question to one panel panelist in particular, please type their name followed by your question. Again, the URL is slido.com and the hashtag to sign in is beyond me too. We will be sharing the URL and the hashtag on a slide deck, uh, on this slide deck throughout the program. And we'll be providing a mic in the audience for those who wish to pose a question that way. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Sarah Jane Finley, Associate Vice President of UBC's Equity and Inclusion Office. Dr. Finley began her professional research and teaching career in the UK at, I should have um, phonetically spelled these out, uh, Loughborough, Loughborough, mm -hmm. <laughs> University of Lecturing in Media and Sociology, and then at the Southampton Institute in Media and Cultural Studies, focusing on gender, race, class, culture, and identity. In 2004, Dr. Finley became a lecturer in the, in the Institute for Culture and Communication at the University of Toronto and served as director, faculty, and in fact, sorry, I want to make sure that's not, served as the director, faculty, and academic life at the University of Toronto until 2015 before coming to UBC. Currently, Dr. Finley supports institution-wide efforts to create a supportive environment for working, learning, and living where respect, civility, diversity, opportunity, and inclusion are valued. These values are central to social sustainability for all members of the community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Jane Finley tonight. Thank you very much, Tana. <clears throat> I am very excited to be here and uh, talk with tonight's panelists about this incredibly important um, topic. Sexual assault and sexual harassment have been a topic on campus for a while and I think the fact that we're talking openly now about these issues um, is really constructive and an excellent uh, development. But I do note that this can also be um, an emotional uh, and difficult conversation at times. And um, I'd ask you to please take care of yourself during the discussion. And if you need some time to step outside, um, please feel free to do that. It seems every day new accusations of uh, harassment come to the fore. From Hollywood to the old Vic in London to the US Senate uh, to our very own streets and uh, office places, workplaces. In response, thousands of women have posted um, the Me Too hashtag on social media, indicating that they too have been sexually uh, assaulted or harassed. And men have since responded with a, a hashtag I will, signaling their individual commitment to take action in order to prevent such events happening in their midst. The hashtag Me Too campaign demonstrates just how pervasive the everyday sexual harassment of women is. But my question is, what next? How can we change what seems to be uh, an accepted way of treating women? How can we improve the workplace? And what concrete role can each and every one of us play in, in helping to make that change? How do we go beyond awareness to actual and more permanent change? 
Well, fortunately, I have four expert panelists with me who can discuss just those questions. Um, so please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming them to the stage. I'll give them a minute to climb up into the chairs. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just take a moment now to introduce each of the panelists um, to you. Our first panelist is Ryan Avola. Ryan currently works as the program manager of iGuy, an educational program for boys in elementary schools across the Lower Mainland via Salima Noon Sexual Health Educators. Ryan also works as a youth worker and continues to organize in his communi communities as an advocate for healthier masculinities. Um, Ryan began his career in Toronto. So did I by volunteering with the White Ribbon Campaign and advocating for education for boys and men around gender-based violence and masculinity. He has developed and facilitated homeschool programs on social justice and creative learning, a leadership program for teenagers, and his own workshops on gender and violence in schools. He remains passionate about bringing meaningful education to youth to help empower them to make future decisions that benefit their self-awareness and relationships to their communities. Thanks. Ryan? Uh, next, we have uh, Fiona McFarlane. Uh, Fiona is Ernst & Young's managing partner of the British Columbia practice and the firm's chief inclusiveness officer. She's also on the board of governors and serves on the executive committee of the Business Council of BC. Additionally, Fiona is a member of the UBC's board of governors as well. Uh, Fiona has been inducted into the Hall of Fame of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. She was awarded the International Women's Forum 2013 Global Women Who Make a Difference Award and has also been recognized as one of the top 35 most influential businesswomen in Vancouver. And that's just a very short list of her many accomplishments and awards. So welcome, Fiona, and Thank thanks you. for joining us. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. No, yeah. no, I'm excited. You, you can that's share in that. <laughs> <laughs> Next is Chantel Krish. Um, Chantel is the Director of Communications and Advocacy for the YWCA Metro Vancouver, focusing on raising awareness and collaborating across sectors to address systemic gaps and barriers to achieving gender equality. These issues include universal child care, addressing the sexualization of women and girls, enduring, ending violence against women, and encouraging civic participation among youth. So just a short list of stuff to do then. Um, Chantel's unique ability to influence public opinion and excite people about social change shapes the YWCA's approach to advocacy. Her inclusive approach to stakeholder engagement has resulted in real policy change at the local, provincial, and federal levels. Thank you, Chantel. And last, but by no means least, uh, Jennifer Berdahl is the professor, professor of Leadership Studies, Women and Diversity at UBC's Sauter School of Business. Professor Berdahl has studied gender in organizations for more than 20 years with over 40 publications to date. Her research has examined power and status in work groups, workplace harassment and discrimination, and the work-family interface. Professor Berdahl is an award-winning MBA teacher. Her research and expert opinions are regularly, regularly featured in the media, including this morning on CBC's early edition. And she has served as an expert witness on gender discrimination cases in the US and Canada, and has provided testimony for the Canadian Senate and House of Commons. So please join me in welcoming all of our guests tonight. All right, just give me a sec. <laughs> Uh, so as I chat to all of our panelists on stage, please feel free to submit your questions um, on uh, the online platform, and I will endeavor to get to the most popular questions during the Q&A portion of tonight's program. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll start, I think, with some questions, um, and I'm going to start with a, quite a broad question to kind of introduce the topic and, and give us a basis from which we can have the discussion. Um, so, I think first we need to understand why we think gender inequity still exists in the workplace. You know, feminism has been around for a long time. Why does this continue to be an issue? Um, and how does this inequity contribute to gender harassment? And Fiona, I'm going to put you on the spot with that first question. 
Yeah, I can say, gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite a deep question and big. But uh, I'm, gonna, I'm the, the person who's not the expert on the panel, so I'm going to start with a little story uh, on how I see um, this whole issue and of inclusion generally. Um, and if you look at the corporate world, and I've been in the corporate world for uh, over 30 years, um, I liken it to um, a corporate stream. And uh, it's for generations, everything that swam in the corporate stream was salmon. And, uh, and then little freshwater fish were introduced into the stream. And that was my generation, you know, 30 plus years ago. And uh, we hopped into the stream and we were swimming around. And after a while, the organization said, there's something wrong with these little freshwater fish. They're just not thriving. So we better help them. We'll outfit them with oxygen tanks and strap them to their gills. So, that, so we got outfitted with oxygen tanks and we swam. Um, and it was really heavy and hard. We could still breathe, but it was heavy and hard. And we still saw the salmon swimming upstream. So we said, well, it must be my, my swimming. I'm just not as good a swimmer. And so for many, many um, little freshwater fish, they exited the stream. And to the salmon, the water is just water. And to the freshwater fish, the water is just water. But essentially, the salt crystals, which are invisible in the culture, kill anything that's not a salmon. And, uh, and so you know, we've spent many uh, decades trying to fix uh, the people who weren't salmon. So I, I joke that uh, you know, I'm a salmon in stilettos. I'm an excellent <laughs> white male, and I can interrupt with the best of them. So, um, but that is really not a sustainable or effective uh, way of, of running businesses. You don't get the best of, of everybody. You just get salmon. And so instead of um, programs to fix people, um, we have to desalinate the water, which means identifying the salt crystals that are very hard to identify um, and desalinating. And I think that the, you know, you asked the question about how does that translate into sexual harassment and, and all of that. It's ultimately about culture. Mm -hmm. And it's the culture not just of the corporate world or the nonprofit world, but the media. And, uh, and uh, we live in very salty water. Mm -hmm. and, and so until we um, identify those crystals and desalinate, I don't think anything's going to change. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I left university, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s, and uh, we, we thought the bras had been burned, like there was nothing stopping us. And, and I look now, and, I, and, and sadly, not much has changed, not really. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Jen, I wonder if, if you could maybe talk a little bit about what you think causes those crystals in the water. What creates that kind of workplace culture where the sexual harassment of women or the, the unequal treatment of women in the workplace um, is uh, sustained and becomes just a part of the water we're swimming in? Well, it's sort of a catch-22, and sexual harassment is a big part of it. And most sexual harassment isn't the Harvey Weinstein style of sexual harassment. It's the hostile work environment harassment, which creates the salt. <laughs> um, so basically, the message is you're not welcome here. And that could involve things from unwelcome comments and jokes or sexual comparisons or sexist comments. Um, but just basically creating an environment in which women don't feel welcome. Um, and that is spurned by, you know, the fact that the workplace is often designed around men, is um, dominated by men, and the people in power are men. And so that signals the idea that to be successful in this organization, you have to act like a man. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, according to our culture, that means being better than women and dominating women sexually and otherwise. And so all of those dynamics contribute to pushing women out, preventing them from even selecting themselves in, and preventing them from ascending to positions of power where they might do something to change that culture. Uh, so when I started, I was talking um, about the fact that this sexual harassment of women is very much every day. And um, what we've seen most recently over the last couple of weeks is women really speaking out about um, their experience of sexual harassment. And not just the Hollywood stars, but also everyday people um, adding to the hash, uh, Me Too um, conversation on um, Twitter. Um, so I'm, I'm interested, uh, maybe Chantal, if, if you would speak to what do you think about this campaign on social media? Do you think it has an impact? Um, 
that kind of advocacy work? Do you think it's, it's important? And um, uh, where might we go with it? I do think it has an impact, and I think there's strength in numbers. A lot of the reason that women and girls who have been sexually harassed or abused or whatever it might look like to them don't come forward is because one, they're not believed by the people that they come forward to. And that could mean anyone from people in their family, people at their workplaces, to the justice and legal system. Right? So when they come forward in such droves, you see the pervasiveness, like how frequent this is at every level of society. And so I think there's power in that, in being able to feel supported by peers who have come forward and said they've had similar or if not the exact same experience. Mm -hmm. And it adds legitimacy and credibility to, to all of them as a group. And unfortunately, that's required when women come forward. They have to prove that something's happened. The onus is on them to, to prove that. And that's very difficult to mm -hmm. prove, uh, especially you know, in a workplace or anywhere, actually, that something happened behind closed doors and it's really your word against his, right? So, so yes, I think that that's powerful. Uh, I think as a movement building piece, you know, at the YWCA, we do a lot of campaigns around public awareness and public education. And social media has revolutionized the way that we can advocate to the public and communicate with them and reach a lot of people. Um, today I was reading about this campaign and I mean it's like 80 countries or something around the world have participated so that's that's significant I think every corner of the world in some way is talking about this issue whether it's you know in the workplace or whatever it might be so I certainly think it has a positive effect great um, Ryan I want to ask you about the the response we saw to the me too campaign with the with the hashtag I will campaign and um, what your your thoughts and reflections are on the, the rise of this response um, yeah, I think it was really interesting to see. Um, again, we saw some, some examples of, of, of men and, and people who are not women also using the MeToo hashtag and mm -hmm. talking about um, sexual assault and, and other aspects of, of gender. Um, and then the I will, I think, was just um, you know, it was another social media response um, to men. And I think men may be feeling some, some responsibility to, to show that, okay, I'm going to engage in this and take on some kind of role. Um, uh, I think for me, it was kind of tricky to see, you know, uh, with social media, it can be very much focused on the self, uh, very much focused a lot on our, our profile. And uh, sometimes we feel like an urge to express something um, through social media that maybe garners likes or garners some kind of... Um, so self-love for ourselves, you know. Um, I want to see that conversation step, uh, like you know, beyond the hashtag and step into our, our lives and actually see impact in our relationships. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I want to see men really show up um, and and engage in those conversations off the internet. Um, and I've I've seen that happening. I've had I've had men reach out to me in in, in numbers that has never happened before. Right. Um, and people are kind of starting to organize in ways that I think I haven't seen. So. I think that's it's a step. It's, it's moving. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the work that you've been doing around uh, with the educating of young men um, uh, about how they can challenge this seemingly accepted way of treating uh, women or those who are who are in um, subordinate positions to mm -hmm. them? Yeah, that's a, a big part of this conversation. I think it's what what can men do, mm -hmm. right? Um, for me, a big thing is is addressing gender roles and gender stereotypes. Um, that violence and, and the sexual assault are symptoms of, of power imbalances that we're learning from children and we're, we're learning, uh, it's being reinforced every day all around us through advertisements and billboards and magazines and movies and um, just discussing that those are stereotypes and that um, there's not a lot of biological basis for the way that we've actually structured gender um, and breaking down that stigma I think is really helpful to allow men and everyone to realize that there are infinite ways that we can express ourselves and that we don't really fit really nicely into nice clean little boxes. <laughs> and um, that can be liberating. That's a really you know, beautiful experience. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of men are, are very afraid of that mm -hmm. and feel that as a, an attack. Um, but I want to show that that's like a really wonderful process to go through. Right. Um, Jen, in your research, have you come across instances of uh, men being objectified by women, of having the tables turned in the workplace? 
Uh, well, that was the first assumption when sexual harassment as a concept became really prevalent. So that was in the early 90s um, when Anita Hill was testifying against Clarence Thomas about being sexually harassed. And then people started saying, well, what about men? It's just about power, so women could do this to men too. There was this movie with Michael Douglas and Demi Moore called Disclosure. I don't know if you remember it, where it was sort of just sort of reversing it. You know, this woman with cleavage coming after this guy, you know, reversing the cultural prototype of sexual harassment, but just the genders. So my colleagues and I looked into, you know, what are men's experiences of sexual harassment? That was one of my first research projects as a graduate student. And we found that men were starting to report in this qualitative study we did um, a, a kind of harassment that hadn't been identified in the literature on women before, and that was harassment for not being man enough in the workplace. So this was very much teasing men about their manhood, their masculinity, their sexual prowess, their childcare responsibilities, you name it. And again, when we define men as, or manhood, as better than and dominant over women, it also implies that you're better than and dominant over any man who is in any way like a woman or does anything feminine. And so this was expressing itself in this form of gender harassment, another hostile work environment form of sex-based harassment that men experience. Uh, and so, and when I'm teaching about sexual harassment, I think lots of times audiences just hear, oh, men are bad, you know, or, you know, sometimes it devolves into this um, testosterone or biological basis of men's behavior. And when you look at the cultural lens that's really driving this um, and the way in which we're socializing and motivating people to prove themselves along these gendered identities, um, men can quickly relate to that experience of being the boy on the playground or seeing the boy on the playground who was teased, right, for being feminine and how that just keeps going into organizations and how that motivates sexual harassment against women. That was, I guess, a long <laughs> answer to your question. Yeah, but okay. yeah, very much. Yeah. It, it goes, it hurts everybody, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's that's true, and that's something we hear so clearly in, in uh, what women are, are speaking out now that that the pain happens in all, all kinds of levels and, and within all kinds of relationships as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in your research, I'm just going to follow up with a question to you, but uh, but please the others if you want to join in, um, have, have you identified what makes a good workplace for people um, that that uh, prevents this kind of harassment from happening? Mm -hmm. Have you seen in your research that's been good? I guess mainly we focus on the problem, so the correlates of organizations that tend to have high rates of sexual harassment. So they do tend to be competitive hierarchical organizational cultures that are dominated by men, which motivates people, of course, to compete uh, according to these gendered identities. Um, and we've identified dimensions of organizational culture in a recent research project that are emblematic of organizations that really have bullying, sexual harassment, all kinds of problems, aka Uber, Fox. <laughs> um, and that's uh, a dog-eat-dog -dog form of organizational culture where you got to watch your back, you can't trust anybody, you're either in the in-group or you're out. Um, there's also put work first, so no work-life balance kind of um, my hours are longer uh, than yours type of competition. Um, and there's also show no weakness, so the inability to express um, uncertainty or any emotion other than anger. Again, sort of those more feminine emotions or expressions. Um, and I'm blanking on the, f the fourth one right now. But those kinds of dimensions of organizational culture um, pr very much predict these kinds of bullying and harassment climates, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chantal, what about you? Have, you? have you seen places that are, are doing good work in this area? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that having a lot of the mechanisms that counteract yeah. what, what was just described are really important. I mean, for sometimes it's as simple as having a, a statement of intolerance and a way to actually report it that leaves accountability with the organization to actually follow up and conduct an investigation and for something to happen at the end of it. Mm -hmm. We saw this with the RCMP class action lawsuit that went over a number of years and there's hundreds of complaints and it kind of just got lost, right? And so what, where does that information go and how do organizations actually process it and then follow through on it? So I think it's really important for, to take these 
these complaints and these situations very seriously and for employees to know that they have a space a safe space to actually make those complaints i know that there's proposed legislation out of ottawa right now that's looking at equating sexual harassment in the workplace with violence in the workplace and so really you know holding those on the same level and so the accountability is at the same level as well and i think that's really important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other thing that fiona talked about is having more diversity across organizations right so more women, more people of color, more visible minorities in decision-making positions to understand what systematic oppression actually feels like and be able to create a workplace culture that doesn't just represent sort of this hierarchical framework that we see so often. Yeah, yeah. So Fiona, in your time, how, what, what changes have you seen and, and in your role uh, with responsibilities around inclusion, um, uh, what actions have you taken yeah. to sort of change the workplace culture? Yeah, so I should, a little disclaimer, so, so my day job is running the business, um, but my chief inclusiveness officer role is, um, is a role of advocacy. Mm -hmm. So we realized that we could work and have the most inclusive culture within EY, um, but if our clients aren't inclusive, then minority women, LBGTQ partners and staff will not thrive. Um, so it's desalinating the water outside of our little pond. Um, and so that's really my role, is to try and get this topic onto the board and CEO agenda as a business issue. Um, but what, you know, I've been, at, I've been in Canada for uh, three decades now, and, um, and at EY for that length of time, and, and I've seen a lot of changes. I, you know, I, they, I was, uh, when I was a young partner uh, almost 30 years ago, there weren't very many of us. In fact, at one point, I was the only female partner in the Vancouver office. Um, if you look at our partner promotions in Canada, um, last year we were 46% women in new partners, and globally we were just under 30%. Mm -hmm. um, and we're 260,000 people around the world, so it's a big organization, so to have made that change is pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it takes Ultimately, it takes leadership. Um, and so if it's not a priority of the organization or if it's seen as something that's just kind of a let's be nice to people um, and it's not a business imperative, it's not about getting the best talent because our assets are our people mm -hmm. and they walk out the door every night. <laughs> and so if you don't get the best um, and keep the best and develop the best, um, you will lose you will lose business. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had um, leadership around the world where, I mean, it's one of our global strategic priorities is inclusion. Right. And there's all sorts of things that, that tie to it that you know, talk about workplace culture, but one of the areas, for instance, is flexibility. Mm -hmm. Flexibility is a right. <laughs> Um, and it's, you know, and if your shtick is getting your cat's nails painted at five o'clock on a Wednesday, then you go for it, you know, so it's not just, oh, it's people who have childcare responsibilities or anything, because that just creates their own little ghettos. And so I think that that to me is desalinating the culture, is having things that apply to everybody so that everyone can thrive. So. Great. Thank you. Um, Thinking, thinking about the, the sort of um, cultures that are created and I think uh, about the kind of policy framework that you were talking about, the clear statement by leadership. Um, uh, Ryan, do you think our measures of accountability are strong enough or what could we be doing to hold um, harassers accountable? What more could we be doing? Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so I've been looking a lot more at uh, what men's groups look like in mm -hmm. men's circles and how men are having these conversations together within themselves. Um, I think that's a big step in, in that accountability piece of holding each other accountable. Um, women and, and LGBTQ and, and other communities that are marginalized and exploited have been making a lot of noise for a long time yeah. and uh, not necessarily being heard, right? So um, holding spaces where men can get together and share the ways that these stories are impacting us, the way that our behavior is impacting each other and our relationships, and learning how to hold each other accountable in a space that as maybe easier for us to share, mm -hmm. um, easier, us, easier for us to maybe break down and be vulnerable and learn what that feels like. I think right now we're not good at that. And um, a lot of the, the accusations create, a, I think, a lot of fear and, and shame 
um, emotionally for men and that, that might feel like they've crossed someone's boundaries or might have been an abuser at some point in their life. And um, definitely having good measures within a workplace and within an organization to, to, um, to discuss that and, and, and what, what those steps forward and, and what really accountability looks like is important. Um, but I want to see spaces in community. I want to see spaces on campus um, where men are getting together once a month or whatever to, to talk about the culture in the workplace, to talk about uh, gender inequality, to talk about inequality and power in general, and, and uh, how we're going to take steps to, to change that culture together. So, I'm, Jen, I wonder if, if the organizations that you look at, which you look at the ones that, that, where it's more prevalent, can you see some of these kinds of things uh, that Ryan's talking about um, taking a hold there and, and working to change the culture? Um, yeah, so, and I remembered the fourth dimension, by the way. Oh. That's <laughs> physical masculinity. <laughs> Uh, basically people who are athletic or organizations that really um, look up at athleticism and kind of physical performances of masculinity um, also have these cultures. So definitely conversations among men are super important because I think people didn't used to think that that was sexual harassment if women weren't present. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. You can talk about women all, all you want. Um, but actually what that's doing is it's degrading your female colleagues and it's encouraging people to look at them in a lesser light. Um, and it's contributing to this culture of the devaluation of women and also by implication men who aren't engaging in those kinds of practices. Um, and in terms of accountability, I, I really do think that organizations are being held accountable by this Me Too movement and people are being held accountable in a way that they haven't been before. We've seen that there's been all these secret settlements and hush money and that kind of stuff going on. Well, this has sort of smashed through that barrier and people are no longer tolerating that. And so the public is now holding organizations accountable. I think what we need to see is organizations holding themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. So when they do get a report, they do something about it. Um, they do a thorough investigation. They um, err on the side of believing the woman and assuming that it could be the tip of an iceberg, because it often is. There's lots, usually lots of other victims. Um, and then also removing the person who there's a reasonable suspicion that they can't hold power in a responsible way, removing them from that position of power at least until you know, the problem has been solved or cleared. So there's a lot that organizations can be doing differently to hold men accountable and others accountable for bad behavior like this. Great, thank you. I'd say, um, I'd say also yeah. just, just, just adding to, to that, I mean I think s sexual harassment and, and assault and stuff is just no, no, but the, the, the culture itself, you can, you can measure all kinds of things that can give you some early warning signals about whether you have some issues. I mean, one of the things we do, we have a scorecard and we look at, uh, for instance, attrition by level, by gender, by ethnicity, etc. And um, we also do a global people survey and we can see if teams, we ask the question, do you feel the culture is inclusive? And, and so if we have pockets where we see that there's an issue, um, then you have to act on it and, and try and understand it and, and deal with it. So there are ways of finding it out. Mm -hmm. I would say that Thank organizations you. often don't do anything about a harasser who's a high performer. Mm -hmm. But one thing that they overlook is that they're actually hurting the performance of everybody else around them. So they're yeah. bringing the organization down even if they themselves are rising as stars. And so looking mm -hmm. at those kinds of attrition or the performance of others is also a, a good clue. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I think we have a good ground for some questions there. And I think we've begun to um, think about this uh, notion of how do we move from this simply being a social media ca um, campaign to being something that shows actual change. And so the, the things you've mentioned around strong leadership, accountability, good policy frameworks, metrics and transparency, I think are all um, important um, additions to that. Um, now I'm going to try and use the um, fancy machine, if I can't see. Do you want to still hold your paper? Um, sorry? Do you want me to hold your paper? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Um, great. So we have a question. We have a, a couple of questions and I, and I will just start with the first one, um, which is uh, gender-based affirmative action has been initiated on campus, um, especially healthy masculinity talk. Uh, do you, you see racially, culturally based affirmative action implemented? 
So we have got some of these conversations now happening on campus, um, and there is a program through the um, Sexual Assault uh, Support Center with the AMS on healthy masculinities. Uh, and I think the question is, is what, what other aspects of, of inclusion in terms of people who are um, racially or culturally based, um, uh, how are they being involved in the conversation? I, today was a really historic day for Canada in that our Prime Minister made a public apology on the treatment of the LGBTQ community over decades ago for their systemic oppression and persecution mm -hmm. just for the fact of their sexual orientation. I think acknowledgement is a very important piece of this conversation and an apology. And you know, I think that you see this a lot with some of the cases. There's there's two routes that people go down, either sort of deny or acknowledge. And is that acknowledgement authentic? And I think even in that, there's a large conversation. So, you know, if that's happening at a university level, around things like affirmative action for racial inclusion, as that example um, asks, is why is that happening in the first place and what kind of acknowledgement of what hasn't been done mm -hmm. has happened before those pieces get put into place? And then when a system is developed around something like affirm affirmative action, who's behind it, who's creating it, and are those people that are themselves have been systematically oppressed? So I think, yes, it's a good idea <laughs> as a short answer, but um, there are a lot of pieces that are involved that require inclusion during the lead up to that process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other, other thoughts on that? question? I think uh, a good thing to remember is um, these conversations have been happening and are happening all the time mm -hmm. and in uh, lots of community spaces and uh, I think with, that, with campaigns like Me Too where it becomes far more popularized um, that also tends to focus on very privileged voices and voices that are, are easily recognized and, mm -hmm. and um, easier for, for more of our pop culture to um, digest. Um, but doing good research and, and reading and, and looking around and actually noticing that there are voices that are, are yelling and screaming and making a lot of noise that aren't being heard um, and making sure that you do that groundwork before you try and create something that is maybe taking away from someone else that's already doing that work. And I've seen, I've seen that start happening yeah. a lot. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we have another question. Um, uh, and an interesting, this was part of a conversation I had earlier today. Um, some men have also shared their uh, hashtag Me Too stories. Should this conversation focus exclusively on women's stories? They know. You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know harass, sexual harassment discriminates by power. It's about power. So it discriminates by power, and it discriminates by gender, race, class, and other things to the extent that those are stratified by power. Um, so you definitely see men also experiencing harassment. They tend to be more vulnerable men or non-hegemonically masculine men um, who are subject. It's funny because bullying, you know, we, we have this term of bullying, but it usually takes the form of gender-based bullying, male on male. Um, and, you know, we could probably call a lot of that gender harassment mm -hmm. um, and discrimination. So, yeah, it is something that men and women experience, but of course women experience it systematically more and men perpetrate it systematically more because of gender differences in power. Great. Any other thoughts on our discussion focusing on women? Um. I've been so a, a part of different men's groups in the course of this last year as I've tried to engage more in this work in myself and in what I'm trying to do for my own uh, awareness and education and um, find certain men's groups can be quite challenging to be a part of um, because often it's kind of reframing the conversation into looking at how men are, are systematically being uh, kind of torn down in this <coughs> climate of, of um, a feminism or the way that we're talking about equality in, in our era. But um, I've been a part of a group more recently that set up the space as an anti-patriarchal space. Mm. And there was four men to come and discuss these issues and how they affect our lives as men. Um, but it wasn't a space to debate whether or not sexism is real or right. whether or not patriarchy is real. Um, that was the groundwork that you had to do on your own to enter that space. Uh, and that created a a really powerful place of, of being vulnerable mm -hmm. and looking at how patriarchy really does affect 
us as men. But it, it, it just eliminated that uh, debate, the discussion of, yeah, but men hurt too, and men, men are depressed, and men are committing suicide, and men are homeless, and um, yeah, we, ha we can have all those conversations. But that doesn't negate the fact that patriarchy is real, mm -hmm. and sexism is real, mm -hmm. and that, that is disproportionately affecting violence. Thank you. Um, now, recognizing that not all of you may have brought your cell phones tonight, um, we also have some mics if there are people in the audience uh, who'd like to ask a question. Um, I don't know where the mics are, but there's some. Oh, there they are. There. Oh, Jamie has the mic. Um, so uh, if you have a question, put your hand up and Jamie will come and bring you the mic. There we go. Hi, my name is Jessica and I'm so delighted to be here and uh, I feel like I am a fish who has swum home <laughs> and I'm getting nurtured, thank you. I also love the salmon metaphor and the desalination and I just want to um, hear your idea. Uh, when us freshwater fish want to talk about desalinization or even mention the existence of salt or even posit the question, should we or can we remove salt from the system? It is my experience, and maybe some others in the room, that that's perceived as a very aggressive attack. And, it is, and I get a lot of physiology back that's like, it's a life-threatening metaphor. And I don't know if salmon, I know if salmon can live in fresh water at the beginning of their lives and at the end of their lives, but maybe they would die if we took away their salt. Anyway, I love the metaphor. I want it to go a long way, but could you help us with just floating this idea without a whole bunch of aggressive physiology coming back our way? How do we, how do we start this conversation? Well, I have a little, little white salmon son, and he always tells me, you're trying to kill me, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, which I'm sure has terrible psychological implications for him. Um, I think the, um, you know, the, the salt of the sort of the micro inequities, and, um, you know, one of the examples that, that I see all the time is the, in, the man interruptions, you know, the, the men interrupt each other, and if you ever watch a, a, a meeting, um, men interrupt each other and the loudest one wins. But if you watch when they interrupt a woman, often the woman keeps quiet right away. And, and I think for some, I know I felt that way, that if you were interrupted, it meant that, the, that they thought your idea was stupid. So you actually lose confidence and then you get even more s silent. So how do you go about, um, about desalinating? I mean, one of the things, which, which was okay because I was in charge, but when I was um, leading meetings, I, um, I had one of the uh, members of, the, of my leadership team, I had him in charge of interruptions. And he was the worst perpetrator. <laughs> and, uh, and so he spent all his energy concentrating on catching everybody else interrupting. <laughs> and so he didn't interrupt at all. So it was, it was one way, but, you know, but what actually is important is, you know, we're talking about gender, but actually if you have a way of running meetings where you don't allow interruptions, it allows people who are maybe more introverted, have different styles, it allows them to be heard, different cultures as well. Another little, I mean, I've got tons of examples, um, and so you can, you can raise it at a time when it's not happening and just say, you know, hey, did you notice that this is a, you know, that Mary's not being heard very, very much. Maybe we should reorient how we, how we have people speak, you know. And so you can do it in a non-threatening, non-sort of accusatory way. But those little examples are everywhere through corporate culture. Um, and you know, how you, how you articulate aspiration, how you, um, you know, the, we always say if you've got um, a job description that's got 10 criteria, the woman comes in, she's got eight, she talks ad nauseam about the two she doesn't have, man comes in with six, 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when am I being promoted? <laughs> and, uh, and that's not good or bad, it's just different. But if you've got people who are interpreting that behavior, who speak the six <laughs> um, language, they, they interpret that, oh, she doesn't have the two, she obviously isn't, she can't do the job. And so those are the sorts of things that are very subtle and very hard to expunge unless you have conversations about them. So I've got lots of examples and, I've, and I can share all kinds of techniques and humor helps mm -hmm. as well. I think um, Brian's point about how patriarchy hurts men is you know, perhaps not the way you want to phrase it, but we, um, in our studies of organizational cultures of masculinity contest is what we call it, these four dimensions of dog eat dog, emotional, family, um, and physical, um, we show that in a lot of data and a lot of organizations that this hurts men as much as it hurts women. Like these are toxic organizational cultures. This, nobody's really thriving except for maybe a couple of the guys at the top. Um, and so it's hurting, you know, physical well-being, emotional well-being, work productivity. People are burning out. People are sabotaging each other. You know, again, think Uber and the stuff that Susan Fowler's post exposed and opened up about that organization, that's the kind of toxic organization that the salt creates. And so your organization's actually gonna be a lot better off if you can get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I think again, like um, for, for men to, to say to another man too, like um, to call their actions and to call, call them in, right? Like, hey, I've been in your situation where I said something that was out of line and I got called out and it was really uncomfortable. And then I learned that I was just doing something wrong and it's okay to mess up, it's okay to make mistakes and, and, and then grow from that. Yeah. And that's like a great feeling, right? I don't need to, to feel under attack because we're changing the environment. I can use that as an opportunity to evolve and become a cooler fish. Yeah. And like, that's, you know, that's opportunity. That's, that's opportunity to grow and learn instead of to stay rigid Right, I think often men are feeling like we got to go back to the old ways and we got to maintain that, like, that, that structure that we feel powerful in. But that, you know, that's gone. It's over. And it wasn't good for us. And we, 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 we know that. So let's, you know, let's take this opportunity to, to learn. And I think that's like, I don't know like, yeah. why that's, that's such a problem. I agree. And we can all learn. Like the implicit mm -hmm. bias, you know, workshops yeah. and stuff tell us all how mm -hmm. we do this. Yeah, build, yeah, we have opportunities to build better relationships. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think right now what we're seeing in the leadership in the United States compared to the leadership here is a really good example of how there are different ways of doing things. And when toxic masculinity is taken to the extreme and there is a following and a base, it can achieve the highest echelon of power and it's very dangerous. And so, you know, I thought something that was really interesting that's come out of the Trump administration is when the travel ban, you know, was revealed and the backlash from the business community in the United States mm -hmm. around, you know, we won't abide by this and just this whole business council is pulling out of, of, you know, the inner circle of the White House. I mean, that's not something that has been you know, seen in a long time, if ever, actually. So you can stand up to power, but it takes power to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of role modeling is really inspiring for, for people to be able to follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, one of the questions we've had on, on, um, through the app um, is uh, from a young professional woman who um, asks, uh, does this have the, if I challenge the sexist culture that's around me, does it have the potential to hurt my career? Um, and how can that be avoided? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends how salty the water is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's how you do it as well. I mean, I think there are obviously egregious situations and, and, uh, and just no tolerance for them at all. But often it's, it is unconscious incompetence and people just have no idea that what they're doing is wrong um, because they've grown up in that salt water, it feels normal, those workplace practices feel normal to, to them and so figuring out how to help them understand that they're not healthy and they're not the only way to, to do it and I think there has been some movement over the last 
number of years in that in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also there are organizations like EY, you know, that are doing things differently, that are educating clients. Like that's a huge thing that can be done at an organizational level that a lot of organizations don't do. So when you're in your career and you're growing it and you're looking, you know, where do I want to make my next move? Um, to identify the values that you have in an organization and see if they align with your own and go after those opportunities. And sometimes that means being aggressive. You know, yeah. that means networking and getting yourself out there and building your brand. But all of that can benefit you in the long run if you actually know this is, this is the kind of place I want to be in and here's where I know I can thrive. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the answer about unconscious incompetence um, is good. But if it's conscious incompetence, um, you know, harassment is kind of by definition conscious because you persist even when someone says no. Um, sort of the whole point is to get under someone's skin and upset them. Then that's a more conscious yeah. behavior. And in that case, you really do need someone in power to protect you and to stand up for it. So if you can find an advocate or someone you trust mm -hmm. um, and perhaps you know, it could be male or female in power who can stand up to that, then I think you're in a much better situation than if you're trying to change the culture or raise these issues as a subordinate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question from the audience. Jamie, there's someone here. Hi. Um, so it's commonly known that males, and particularly white males, experience workplace advancement much more frequently than women, or in particular women of color. Um, I'm about to graduate. Um, <laughs> I put in a lot of work and effort into my two degrees, um, and I'm really terrified that um, my hard work will kind of just go to waste or won't be as recognized as it should be in comparison to my male colleagues in the future. Um, and I just have, a qu like, I'm wondering if you guys have any advice for me or people in my position um, who have these concerns um, in regards to moving forward with my career. How do you keep your head above water when these uh, gender inequalities, these microaggressions, are so frequent in your everyday lives. Oh, hallelujah that you know about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Canada actually, I, and this I'll go a little rant quickly, but Canada reached um, education gender parity um, in 2013. And in the last 10 years, we've slipped from in the workplace and elsewhere um, from number uh, 11 to 35, I think mm. it is, in 10 years. So we've dropped whatever, 35 spots, whatever. The, I see I'm not a, law, I'm a lawyer, <laughs> not an accountant, so <laughs> I can't add. But, um, you know, and I, and I think a lot of people come out of organizations like high school and university where it is a meritocracy to, to, to a larger degree, and then they go into, they hop into the salt water, and they think that what they used to do that got them ahead hard work and intelligence is going to be all they need in the, the new environment and that doesn't help you thrive in salt water so you know in an ideal world I'd say we just wave a magic wand and desalinate the water but it's happening very slowly and so I would say try um, try and um, learn the culture as Chantel said pick the right organization make sure it has values that are aligned with your own and then be really smart about it mm -hmm. you know be really um, strategic in what you do and understand the salt water um, because until we have enough freshwater fish thriving and that's cultural and gender and sexuality and disability first nations um, until we change we have enough swimming in that pond um, it's very, very hard to, uh, to desalinate. And so, anyway, I, yeah, you know, understand some of the things that um, might work in your own freshwater pool that don't work in, in the salt water. So, 
going into it. I, I got an example. I'll just give a little example. So um, you can tell I've got way too many stories. But this young woman came to me. She was coming to get some budget for some social activities. And I said, you know, you, you're really highly regarded. Um, and we would love you to um, aspire to partnership. And she said to me, oh, I don't think so. You know, I've got two kids, and I'm Asian, and my in-laws live with me, and I know that. And she just basically vomited all her problems on the table. And, uh, I, and I said to her, like, time out. If I asked John if he wanted to be a partner, he'd go, yeah, absolutely. He may be thinking, oh, I've got two kids, and I've got this and everything, but he doesn't say that. And then I, so as a manager, who am I going to invest in? Am I going to invest in this young woman who's already told me that she really doesn't think she wants to be a partner because there's too many things in the way, or am I going to invest in this young man? So when I asked her that question, is that what, what you were intending, she said, no, that wasn't what I wanted. That wasn't the impression. So it's about talking a different language and understanding what that language is in the salt water. And you may say that's totally unfair. We shouldn't have to change. Um, and that's right. <laughs> it's totally unfair. But but it, it isn't changing without us becoming smarter at how to swim in the salt water. Yeah. Another thing that, in addition to that, is something that's really helped me throughout my career is having a mentor that I can bounce these situations off of and anticipating the situation before they happen. So if you are a star performer and you say, you know, I want to be made partner, but I have all of these barriers. Trying to learn how to frame that potential conversation with mm -hmm. someone that has business experience is a huge asset because so much, what Fiona is saying, mm -hmm. so much of who we are is how we present ourselves to the people around us in any aspect in life. And so in, uh, in the workplace, that's absolutely true. I mean, if you're a star performer and you're doing really well, you should pro project that confidence of what you built in yourself and having someone that I've been able to bounce ideas off of and just how do I talk about this, how do I ask for a raise, how do mm -hmm. I negotiate a promotion so that when you go into that room and that conversation might happen and you don't always know when it's going to happen, right, mm -hmm. that you're prepared and that's, yeah. that's a huge benefit. I was going to say that my um, awesome PhD student, Barnini Bhattacharya, is in the very back of the room <laughs> and she studies this issue of um, uh, women of color's experiences in the workplace um, and one of the phenomenon uh, that her research has identified is how invisible they tend to be. So um, kind of overlooked, uh, confused with one another, uh, and in a particular form that sort of takes the form of sexual harassment is the exotization um, of women, um, minority women. So, you know, how to manage that invisibility and that, that form of potential sexual harassment, um, you know, perhaps becoming visible in some way, like just sort of wearing it loud and proud and just being who you are and being bold might help um, overcome some of that, but I can't really speak to systematic research that would address that. Uh, we're only just starting to really delve into it. I think it's a field, but... Yeah, I could say one sort of practical thing that I, I made a huge mistake when I was a, a young, a youngster in, in work. I became a partner and um, and then I was asked to do everything. It's the office housework thing. Mm -hmm. So I ran the holiday party. I ran all, you know, every, every bit of housework in, in our firm, I did. Um, and, I, and, and I couldn't f understand why I wasn't being heard. Um, and so eventually I just gave all of that up. And I thought, I'm going to build the biggest damn book of business there is. And when I did that, um, suddenly I was heard in all the other aspects of it. So understanding, you know, in professional services, the size of the book of business is really important. And that's how you, you sort of climb up the, the ranks. Doing the housework, even though people might tell you it's a great opportunity to, you know, hone your leadership skills or, or whatever, or get into decorating. Um, um, <laughs> You know, if you, if you buy into that, and uh, people say it with the, you know, I think they really believe it. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look at performance roundtables and things like that, you get absolutely diddly. No money, no promotion for doing all those other things. 
So if you want to do them, do them because you understand that they're not going to get you ahead, but they feed your soul. So if they feed your soul, do it. But if you're doing it because you think you, it's going to advance your career, understand what's really going to advance your career. Uh, so we have a question um, here uh, that takes us a little bit back to what we were um, originally focusing on. Uh, so someone's asking, social media is far-reaching, but recent examples suggest that it is corrosive to public discourse, not uniting. Can it really be a place for positive change? Mm -hmm. Super good question. <laughs> Got a super good answer. Um, no, I don't, know. <laughs> no not, I don't even know what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, to speak on that, though, um, last month I held a conversation downtown about some of the work that I do and tried to draw in some of an audience and speak a lot to men about um, the way I've witnessed men's circles and men's groups and how men are having these conversations, just to try and spark a bit of a conversation. Um, it happened to be planned months in advance and landed the week Me Too uh, exploded. So um, there was a lot of conversations that wanted to continue after that event. So uh, in order to keep everyone connected, I very quickly and unorganized uh, put together a Facebook group for people from that event to kind of get into and, and basically just see what happens. And uh, there's still very little intention for the group. There are still not proper guidelines set up. And uh, there are potential, there have been conversations that have gone into um, places that are not okay and, and they're causing harm to other people in the group. And it just brings up over and over, how do we have these conversations in a digital space? I don't know. I, I think um, I'm trying to focus on using social media as a platform to raise awareness about events in the community and, um, and articles that we can read, um, less about debating really complicated emotional things and more about getting information out there and then learning about events that we can go meet each other like this mm -hmm. face to face and we can have these conversations where we can really feel each other. I don't know if we can do that on, on Facebook or not. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I, I certainly think we've seen and heard about lots of examples of women who have been public figures and the uh, very significant um, harassment and violent harassment mm. they've received through public uh, um, these kinds mm. of sources. And, and um, so I, I think it is a question of, of what framework do we put around it and um, uh, mm -hmm. how do you have rules in a, in a, in a rule-less space? Yeah, yeah. 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 Chantal, were you I think. I think it can do both. It can be really positive and it can galvanize a lot of support for an issue and it can also have the opposite effect and you know it's like reading the comments section of any article about really any controversial issue will put you down a rabbit hole where you'll lose all faith in humanity, right? So do you want to go in that direction or do you want to be inspired? And you know, I, I hear this very often, like, oh, I was on Facebook and my cousin and I got in this argument about the Trump administration. It's like, those aren't necessarily constructive dialogues to be having because, first of all, they're in front of a lot of people that are in your social network, whether you like it or not, right? And also, what's the goal and what's the objective? So one of the things that, you know, we do a lot of work on is creating public awareness campaigns and using social media as a tool to highlight and leverage the message, but using research and experts and graphics and visuals and things like Facebook Live and ways to engage. And so having a plan behind it and a strategy is key. If you want to be part of the conversation, join in in, in campaigns or in, you know, in social media activities that look like that so that you're supported by you know, maybe other organizations and people with similar views. And there'll always be opposing views. And I think it's important to have conversations with people that don't all agree with you. Otherwise, we're not actually going to achieve much, right? But knowing that you're also supported and protected in a space that is safe. So it doesn't derail and you don't personally feel triggered or attacked. Um, something that comes up a lot in the, the boys program that I do is um, I think a lot of the, the media and social media that young people are ex exposed to are a lot of these kind of more uh, poisonous spaces on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, they're reading comments on YouTube mm -hmm. po posts and they're reading um, articles that they don't really understand that are kind of sensationalizing an idea that's not really accurate or not coming from a, a good source and are believing those things. And uh, feminism gets attacked incredibly uh, large ways on on the internet and uh, social justice warriors are, are severely attacked and 
it's creating a climate, I think, for youth where they think to care is to, to be a feminist or to be to care about social justice is like not not a good thing, mm. um, and that that scares me a lot. And mm -hmm. um, there are usually boys in the circle that um, want to learn about feminism and have wanted to learn about um, different sexualities and different gender identities, and have just come across a bunch of garbage on the internet that freaks them out and feel like something's wrong with them, and and then that's what gets enforced, and I think that's really sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we have uh, time for one more question from the audience, um, and there was a fast hand up there, yeah. so <laughs> you won. Hi, I'm really enjoying the conversation. Pro props to UBC for, for hosting this. Um, my question is twofold, and I apologize, I haven't fully formed my thoughts, but I'm picking up on two trends um, for solutions and, on, you know, to, to address beyond Me Too. So we, we said that you know, most, most behavior that is inappropriate is unconscious. So how do we address making it more conscious, right? Um, hosting conversations like these more often. Um, I know I'm from UC in Calgary, never once had the opportunity to, to discuss uh, uh, grievances with um, grad school profs that um, didn't particularly think the behavior that they were engaging in was inappropriate when it most most definitely was because it was being talked about. Um, it was also addressed, but you know um, uh, looked over really. Uh, um. So my question is: Okay, so we're having more conversations like this, but how are we engaging people that should be engaged in these conversations? I look around and I don't see a lot of male, a lot of the male faculty from UBC, and I would have loved to have somebody from the male faculty of UBC being. In, in the panel, right? And it's a great panel, I love this. <laughs> but I want them to be sort of challenged on views that they, uh, you know, on behaviors that they don't experience because they're not uh, experiencing that on, the, on a daily basis, so I guess. A lot of questions there. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I wonder if one of your questions might be about um, uh, male champions for um, uh, challenging sexual harassment? In yeah. Increased, increased engagement of people in power around yeah. sexual harassment. Um, again, I don't, I, don't, I don't work a lot with adults. Um, <laughs> For a good reason. <laughs> um, I like working with kids, right? They're more creative, they're willing to learn. Um, that's my approach, you know? Some of us, it's too late for us, you know? But um, no, it's a really good question. I think for me, role models have been huge for me, and getting into this work um, was definitely because of the women in my life and, and my mom and, and partners that I had, but it wasn't until I met uh, a man that was doing this work that totally inspired me and, and showed me how I could do this work as a man, that um, often I was taking up spaces that I shouldn't have been taking up um, because I cared and I wanted to be an activist. But um, if we have more men um, focused more on masculinity and then breaking down gender stereotypes and patriarchy from a, a perspective of their own experiences as a man, um, that's going to inspire more men to get into the conversation. Um, again, I think that it's hard in a, in a diverse group. Um, sometimes we need spaces where um, we can say things that aren't okay or that, that would hurt somebody and uh, have, have a space where that, that is kind of protected so that we can go through this hard learning. I think we're in hard learning stage right now, especially for men, and a lot of this can feel very um, self-defeating and, and like painful to go through. Um, so having, having men supporting each other through that and, and understand that there are ways of creating restorative justice that, that is healing. Um, for me, um, trying to find good role models is super important. And, uh, maybe looking to elders and looking to other um, ways that um, we've maybe lost through colonization and through white supremacy that, that don't really exist right now in our, in our society. We don't really have great methods for healing in ways like this. Um, so for me, it's just connecting with other men. Uh, which is huge for me, and I'm uh, just hopefully inspiring other men to, to come into that conversation. Maybe the, the flip side of, of that as well is, is that um, for women and, and people who are, who are marginalized, aspire to, to lead. And 
sometimes you know it feels hard and it's like oh I just don't feel like fighting this battle um, but it's not about you and it's about the world you're creating and so I feel like my generation has failed and so really the the ask is that aspire to leadership because leadership will allow you to make the world better and you can change it um, and yeah it's just you know, bring up your children well. <laughs> don't do, don't create. You know, educate them. Let them let them be themselves. So, mm -hmm. so have um, you know Ashley Judd and others in your generation, uh, my my generation too, uh, <laughs> but who are starting to speak about their own personal experiences. I think that's one of the powerful things that's happened is in. Instead of just sort of hush hush um, coming out and just saying, yeah, this happened to me when I was not in a position of power um, is a powerful way to sort of break through that. And I think that's part of the Me Too is it took incredibly powerful voices to, you know, be believed and to open up those gates for everybody else to share their stories. Um, I also, back to Ashley Judd, like the way she, in her interview that she did with Nicholas Kristof, talked about let's start raising more awareness about the patterns that perpetrators engage in when they are confronted. So she used this acronym DARVOS for deny, attack, and reverse the order of victim and offender. That's a very typical thing a, a sexual harasser will do when you confront them about their behavior is they'll deny it they'll attack you and then they'll play the victim. <laughs> You've hurt my feelings or what have you done? Um, and so as perpetrators, I guess unconscious ones, um, not pushing back and just totally respecting when somebody says, I'm uncomfortable with that comment and not defending the comment and not defending your motives for the comment, just saying, okay, I'm, I'm so sorry I caused offense, I made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is an issue that makes a lot of men very uncomfortable. And so to engage with, and women as well actually, but to engage with men in positions of power that might be uncomfortable, there have to be ways of inclusion and there have to be pathways into this work. And so that could look like creating advisory groups that engage with high-level powerful men as well as women on this kind of work, right? And that's just one example, but it has to be done in a way that is solutions-based as well. And that's frustrating because, you know, I was working in a women's organization where we see the impacts of patriarchy and oppression and gender inequality every day with the people that we serve. It's frustrating to say, well, now I'm supposed to have an open hand and heart and, you know, kind of glaze over everything that's sort of happened. And I know personally I struggled with that a lot when I started working at the YWCA, but I learned very quickly that we're trying to create a movement and a movement building you can't just do with one half of the population, right? And so you have to find, it's not a compromise, but it's meeting at a point where everyone feels like they can actually make a contribution. And I think having representation, like you said, on a panel like this is really important, but making it really about what the value be for the group to have that voice there and then, and then hoping that they show up, that's really important too. And I think conversations like what's, what are happening now are forcing a lot more awareness on this issue. Mm -hmm. And fear is also a strong motivator. So <laughs> I think that uh, we're at a tipping point and it's actually a positive place to be. Great, thank you. So just uh, before I hand over to Deanna, maybe one final thought from each of you uh, quickly as a takeaway for, for the audience. And Ryan, you're next to me, so you get to go first. All right. Um, just on, on that last note, what I was thinking about there is maybe um, um, for men, um, expressing ourselves is a huge part of this. Um, I think a big part of gender stereotypes and the way we've learned about masculinity and being manly meant not talking about our feelings, not being expressive, that that's a sign of weakness and that's a bad thing. We all feel stuff. Um, find a way to express yourself, whether that's art, movement, yoga, boxing, something, whatever is, feels right for you and your body and, and what makes sense for you. I think men, if we start taking those practices, even on our own, at home drawing or painting or some kind of expression, working through those feelings, things you don't talk about, why don't you talk about them? How, why don't you express them? Finding ways to get through that and practice that, I think that'll, you'll, we learn compassion, we learn empathy through that, and that'll, that'll change our relationships. All right, thank you, Ryan. Fiona? Change takes courage. 
-hmm. and, and so um, understanding that if you are courageous, you can make a difference, you can make a huge difference. And so if each one of us um, does something courageous as often as we can, whether it's catching people behaving inappropriately or identifying salt crystals or, or reaching out to include people that you don't usually include, as Chantel said, people who have perspectives that are not like yours. So that takes courage. And so I'd just say, Canada's the best country in the world, so <laughs> tap into that courage, is <laughs> worth it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. They're all great points. One thing I would add is learn how to form an opinion and be able to argue your opinion in a way that's constructive. And so if you're in a position, you know, one of the things we're talking about with mentorship, like if you're in a position where you've been blindsided or someone raises something and it's completely opposite to your view, be able to, to argue and debate why that is in a constructive, calm way that can actually lead to potential alliances and change. And I think that that's a really important piece of it. Um, <laughs> I'm long-winded, so I'll try to be very short. Uh, it's hard to know how to end. Um, I guess, you know, I like the courageous point and also the point that it's not about you. You know, I think it really is about the world we're creating and what we leave behind and how we try to improve it. Um, when it comes to sexual harassment, you know, try to be bold and stand up to it. I know that's extremely hard and most people don't uh, because they're afraid of retaliation and the perpetrator almost always has more power than they do. But they're creating more power by harassing you, right? Like that's the point. And so the more you can stand up to it and say no, um, the less you give that to them and document, document, document. <laughs> so if you're ever in a situation where you do have to do an official report or complaint, the more you can document, the better off you'll be. All right. Thank you all for those final words. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your, for, for your thoughts and contributions this evening. Um, I think we've all got some ideas to how to go away and have a low-sodium diet from here on in. <laughs> um, so a huge thank you to our um, incredible panelists. Um, it was a delight to chat with them this evening and to hear your questions as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you.